All right, let's go and get started. A um, couple things. Number one, if you haven't already turned in your homework, go ahead and do so. I've got a pile started right here. Um, I've also got the sign-in sheet. I remembered it this time. Um, so I've got a sign-in sheet started. All right, so let's make sure everybody's clear on the timeline. All right, so on Friday, we have our first celebration of learning. We got an exam on Friday. So on Wednesday, um, let, let's be clear. You come in. Um, Hopefully we'll have your homework graded. At the very least, I will have a solution for your homework uh, on Wednesday. I'll have a few re uh, review slides for you, and then you all ask whatever questions you want, and I will do my best to answer them. What I'm going to do for the exam is I'm going to allow us to start at 9.55, so I'm going to end uh, uh, steel design a little early. Um, unless I'm mistaken, does anybody have any class after this, directly after this? I don't think anybody does. We could go to 1030 if you want. <laughs> I, I'm very seriously considering going to, uh, to 1130 um, if, if nobody has a scheduling conflict. I'll send an email to let everybody know. Yes, sir. Oh, hold on. Do, would I? No, hold on. Would I do that? <laughs> now, come on, you, you all know me. I'm, I'm a pretty reasonable guy, so I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to, take, you know, give you a, a, a I'm not going to add material to the exam. The exam is the exam, so I won't do that. I said celebration of learning, so I said it earlier. All right, all right, all right, all right. Everybody good on, on uh, Wednesday, so make sure you come prepared to ask questions. You all know the drill on formula sheets, uh, eight and a half by 11 front and back, but whatever you want except for worked out examples. Yes, sir. Good question. The last topic on the exam is slabs. No One-way slabs, no T-beams. No slabs are on the exam. No T-beam. Homework one to homework four. No no T-beams, no, no, none of that, no flange sections, all right? Yeah. Come on. The formula sheet. You can. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Is everybody good? Okay, all right. Let's get into a uh, discussion of T-beams real quick. So um, let's, sort of, let's sort of recap, okay? Um, I want to make sure that everybody remembers what was going on with the last example. So with the last example, um, we were looking at um, rectangular versus true T-beams. Everybody good? All right. And um, what I'm interested in right now is everybody understands the difference between what a rectangular T-beam is and what a true T-beam is. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, because that, that, in my opinion, is probably one of the most important topics to understand for design. If you understand that, then I think the design procedure that we're going to discuss today is going to make a little bit more sense. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to let you know the design procedure is a little long, or it's going to seem a little long, but it's really a function of whether or not we're dealing with rectangular versus true. Do you have a question? All right. Sign-in sheet going around? All right, all right. Settle down, now. Settle down. Okay, all right. So let me be clear on one thing in regards to T-beam design. This is a design of a known cross-section, okay? By now, you all know how to size a slab and you know how to size a singly reinforced beam. So you could literally take the slab and the beam and put them together and there's your T-beam. So that, that's not a, a, a big issue, okay? The geometry is by and large going to be known at the beginning of the problem anyways. And again, going back to some of the stuff we've talked about before, you can have precast elements that we're using that are T-shaped. Um, also, uh, in many cases, we're sizing the, the beam based off of its uh, own moment requirements or deflection or things like that. So the size of the beam really isn't the big issue. The big problem with T-beam design is determining the amount of reinforcement. That's where all the work goes into play. Um, one of the nice things about that, though, is if you already know what the size of the beam is, then you already know how heavy the beam is. So you don't have to initially assume 
a, uh, uh, a beam self wave. So that, that makes our life a little easier. Okay. So if you understand uh, this, then you understand that the analysis, or in other words, the strength of a, uh, a reinforced concrete T-beam is a function of whether or not it's a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam. So in design mode, we gotta, we got to be able to figure out which one's going to be the case. So here's how uh, we go about this. So the first thing that we do is we start off and we assume that the beam is rectangular. Okay, so it's a rectangular T-beam. All right. Now, let me, let me go back. Just to be clear, when we have a rectangular T-beam, remember, this dimension right here, this is the thickness of the flange, and then this dimension A is from the top to the bottom of our stress block. So for it to be a rectangular T-beam, our stress block depth A has to be less than or equal to H sub F. Everybody okay with that? Am I good on that? All right. If not, if, if we have a 4-inch thick flange and we back calculate A and this is you know, 7.2 inches, we were wrong, and it's a true T-beam. Sound good? All right, so here's how this is going to work. We're going to start off assuming that we've got a rectangular T-beam. So we're going to start off making an assumption. Now, if we have a rectangular beam, then the reinforcement ratio is simple, right? We've already derived that. Remember this equation right here? This equation was the uh, reinforcement ratio for a known cross-section. We're not using that 0.18 FC prime over FY because we know what the beam looks like. Sound good? So if we know what the beam looks like, we can back, or we can back calculate and solve for how much of a reinforcement ratio that we would need, and we get this. Now before I start taking that reinforcement ratio and going and picking rebar, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to take that reinforcement ratio, and I'm going to use that to calculate A. Okay. Now, if I've got a rectangular beam, what do we have? ASFY over 0.85 FC prime B. Sound good? All right. So, since the area of the steel is just rho BD, I'm going to plug that in, and I'm going to see what my A value is. In other words, assuming a rectangular beam, I'm going to determine how much reinforcement I need, and then if I use that much reinforcement, what would my A value be? So if I got a four inch thick flange and I back calculate this and I get two inches, well then my assumption was correct and I've got a rectangular T-beam. If I'm wrong, then I got to do a little bit more work and I'm dealing with, with true T-beam territory. You all should uh, <coughs> at least remember that when dealing with rectangular T-beams versus true T-beams, true T-beams were a little tougher to analyze, right? They had a little bit more going on. Sound good? Specifically, they had this. So true T-beam, we have a T-shaped uh, stress block. And if you've got a T-shaped stress block, what you need to do is split that up into two separate components, right? We have a, uh, a moment capacity of the flange component and a moment capacity of the, uh, of the web uh, component, the flange couple and the web couple. All right, uh, sound good? Now, let's, let's make sure we're clear on a few things when we derive uh, our design procedure. So number one, if I take this compressive force and this compressive force and I add them together, that's C, right? That's the compressive uh, force in our concrete beam, right? And we have done our entire uh, analysis and all of our derivations based on one fundamental principle, and that is C equals T. The compression force in the beam has to equal the tensile force in the beam, right? So in other words, if I take C here plus C here and I add that up, C has got to equal whatever tensile force I'm getting here. Does that sound good? Now, I also propose that I, C equals T has to be true for each of these individual components as well. So I propose that just based on equilibrium, there's got to be some amount of steel required here for this equilibrium to, to be met and some amount of steel over here that needs to be uh, achieved in order for equilibrium to be met. So in other words, I need some amount of steel for this flange couple and some amount of steel for this web couple. If I add them up, that's how much steel I need for the beam. And that's how I'm going to go about this. So that's point one. Does that make sense? All right, so that's point one. Here's point two. One of the differences between the flange couple and the web couple is if you look at this flange couple, one term I don't see in this flange couple is A. There's no A term over here. This is B right here. That's B. 
This is B sub W, and that term is H sub F. So there's no A distance on, uh, on that couple at all. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on that one first, and then subtract and figure out what I need for the, the web couple. Don't worry if you don't if you follow the, the specific um, math behind it, because we're going to cover that. But I just want to make sure that it makes sense. We're going to start here, since we don't have an A. Everybody good? OK. Now. I propose, just keep it simple, that the moment capacity of a true T-beam is the moment capacity of the flange couple and the moment capacity of the web couple added up. Sound good? Now notice how I got a phi value on each of those. I got phi MN, phi MNF, phi MNW. Everybody okay with that? Another thing I, um, I'm going to do is I'm going to, like I said before, I'm going to start off with the flange couple and then go back and back calculate what's going to go on the web couple and the big reason uh, is because of A. Now, if you're still not following me on that, let's take a look at this. All right. So we derived this last time. We've got our flange couple and oh no, here's mistake number three. I just realized that's supposed to be MNW. Man. Oh, so it's two and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, 2.75. <laughs> what are bonus points? Uh? Yeah, for, yeah, we, yeah, you're the one who said we didn't have exams in college. We had celebrations of learning. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right, now this one's MNW and this one's MNF. But um, let's, let's go through the math, okay? So let's, let's, let's get back on point. So. Let's be clear, a moment is simple. It's just a force times a distance, okay? So what do we got for force? Well, it's the compression force in the flange, which is 0.85 FC prime times the width and the thickness. Now, the thickness is H sub F. The width is B minus that B sub W. Sound good? Now, for the web couple, it's the compressive force in the web times the moment arm of D minus A over 2. Compressive force is 0.85 FC prime times A times BW. Sound good? But the big point I want to mention is look up here on this one up top. There's no A. A is not there. And that's really important, okay? Because A is a function of that reinforcement ratio. That's what was our whole assumption was, was based off on whether or not we were dealing with a rectangular T-beam or a true T-beam. It was based on whether, whether or not where A was. <clears throat> the fact that this doesn't have an A in it means I can compute that moment capacity right at the beginning of the problem with no knowledge whatsoever of the steel uh, that's there. I don't need the steel at all to determine M and F. And that's important. Okay? Does that make sense? Because I've got two unknowns, but if I can solve if I can solve this one, the, the idea is this. Now I'm, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna answer your question by delving in a little further. If I'm designing a true T-beam, here's the long and short of it. So I need to select an amount of reinforcement, right, that will safely resist those loads. So phi mn has to be greater than or equal to mu. Okay. So I know mu. I know the factored moments. I can take this component up here, this upper one, back calculate and figure out how much steel I need for this. That's point one. Then if I know the factored moment and I know this, I can solve for what this needs to be. And if I can solve for what this needs to be, I can then solve for what that needs to be. If A was showing up in both of them, I'd have like two equations and two unknowns and it would just get more complicated. I don't like two equations and two unknowns. I like to avoid that if I can. Does that make sense? All right. So that, that's really why. I mean, we could do it. There was another term there, but it, it would just get, the math would get more and more rigorous. Uh, I, I do my best to try and keep it as simple as I can without mistakes. Sound good? I could, and, and honestly, there, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Personally, 
I just think the math is a little easier for both of them doing it this way. There is nothing that says that your methodology is wrong. It's just, I think this is a little easier. Um, I will say this, this height, well, that height I guess would be A minus H sub F, so I guess, yeah, six one half dozen of the other. You could formulate it that way. Um, I also would say this, whether or not you did your moment capacity this way or doing it the way you're saying, just treat a solid flange and then just have this little sliver right here, um, you wouldn't reduce the total number of steps, okay? That's point one. And you really probably wouldn't reduce the total number of button crunching, right? You'd have really the same amount of button crunching required to get this moment capacity and this. So, yeah, you could do that. I, I don't know that there's really anything wrong with it. I just don't know that it, you'd save time one way or the other. Is that a fair answer? And, and yet yeah, there's really, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you'd still arrive at the same conclusion that you could solve for the, the flange couple and then back calculate what you needed for the web couple. I don't think that there's, there's really nothing wrong with that. I just, this, I guess this is really, this is just traditionally how it's done. I don't know that I have a better answer than that. So, so yeah. Sound good? Yeah, I, it just, it is what it is. Um, Okay, so let, let me sort of keep on point with the required steel for the flame steel couple and for the web steel couple. So going back to what I was saying earlier, I propose that for each of those couples, okay, C's got to equal T. Right? Just because I split it up, whether or not I split it up into this uh, pattern or what you're saying, where just to take the entire flange as one stress block and then that little chunk of the web as a stress block, there's still got to be a certain amount of steel for this one and a certain amount of steel for that one. That doesn't change. Okay, I propose that for both of those, since C has to equal T to meet equilibrium, I have got to provide a certain amount of steel for each couple. So I propose if I add up however much steel I need here and add up however much steel I need here, that tells me how much steel I need to pick for the, uh, the entire cross section. So <clears throat> for the flange steel couple, I don't need A. So I can literally take this and calculate how much steel I need right off the bat. I don't need A, I don't even really need moments. I can just take the geometry and just add it up and say, here's how much steel I need. Now, I would not finish the problem there because if I said, okay, this is how much steel I need to pick in the beam and then that's it, the beam would be undersized. I would not have enough reinforcement because this will only provide enough reinforcement to meet the requirements of that couple. I still got this going on uh, as well. Sound good? All right. Okay. Now, for the web capacity, what I'm doing here is this. This is what I was mentioning earlier. So the flange, uh, if I take the flange moment and the web moment and I add them up, that gives me the nominal capacity for the entire section. Okay. That nominal capacity has got to be greater than or equal to the loads that we put on it. Okay. So if I know this and I know the loads that are on it, I mean, I'm designing, I'm in design mode. I back calculate and I solve for the nominal moment for the web. All right, take that, back calculate and solve for my steel. Does that sound good? So you know me, I'm pretty nice. I have the nice little step-by-step -step, uh, procedure. I, it's going to look longer than what we've done for known cross-sections, and I guess it is, but there's portions that we skip. Okay, so, so bear with me. All right, so number one. We compute a, a, a factored moment uh, on the beam, okay? Now, nice thing, we don't have to assume the, uh, the, uh, the, the self-weight because we know the dimensions, all right? We are going to assume a fee value of 0.9, which we're going to have to go back and check. Yes, sir? That's a good question. That's sort of what I was mentioning earlier. You can size a slab right now. You can size a beam, just a rectangular beam right now. Why well, propose a T-beam is nothing more than a beam in a slab. You could argue that one of the, I guess, goals of what we're trying to do with T-beam design is you know how to pick reinforcement for a given rectangular beam, right? You know how to pick reinforcement for a slab. Well, I propose if you stick a beam and a slab together and you get a T-beam, 
and you go back and try and iterate on that reinforcement, you'll need less reinforcement for a T-beam than you would for the single rectangular beam because you got more concrete. All right. So you could argue that's one of the points of what it is we're trying to do here is maybe by considering T-beam behavior, we are reducing the amount of steel we need overall. That's a good question. All right. Is, it, is everybody else okay with that? This is good stuff. All right. Now, but let's also be clear, we are assuming that. We are going to have to go back and check that. Okay. So MN required is MU over phi. So MU over phi, we get our MN, we take that, we plug it into here. Now, this is important. By plugging in uh, uh, into this equation, we're making a blanket assumption right off the bat that this is a rectangular cross-section. It might not be. Okay. Now, how do we verify that? Well, we take that row and we plug it in here. Because remember, this equation was derived assuming we've got a rectangular cross-section. So basically, we're solving for how much steel we would need if it was rectangular. Okay? If it's rectangular, good, it's a rectangular cross-section. If not, we have to deal with a, rectang or a true T-beam. So here's where the procedure, I guess, sort of deviates a little bit. So if this quantity is less than or equal to the flange thickness, then our assumption was correct and we are dealing with a rectangular T-beam and we go to step five. Otherwise, we go to step eight. So this is where the procedure looks longer, I know, but we're skipping some stuff, okay? So sound good? So if we're a rectangular T-beam, all we do is rho BD, because it's rectangular, we know the dimensions of our stress block and our reinforcement ratio, select a pattern of steel, and analyze. That's it, okay? If it's a true T-beam, it's a little more intricate. Now, like I said, with the true T-beam, we can directly solve right now for what's going on in the, uh, the flange couple. So we'll solve for the amount of steel required, and we'll solve for the moment capacity. If we know how much moment capacity we get from the flange couple and we know the loads, we can back calculate what we need on the, uh, the web couple. Once we take that, we can take the web couple, compute that, and, and go to work which I guess this is another indirect answer to your question, which is why do we do this, okay? This web couple on the right is on the end, you know, on the whole, this is essentially the same geometry as a simple rectangular beam. Because of that, we can use this same equation for our row. Otherwise, we'd have to derive a, a whole new one. You see what I mean? Because the stress block wouldn't go to the top of the beam, it'd go to the top of the flange. So the geometry would change a little bit, and ultimately that would change a little bit. So I guess that's another, maybe a little indirect question to your, your uh, answer to your question. Blah. Sound good? All right. <clears throat> so if we've got a true T-beam, deal with the flange couple first, then deal with the web couple, add up your steel, pick a pattern, and then analyze. So it looks like, oh, it's a 13-step process as to design a T-beam, not really, you know. It, that's not really the case, okay, because a lot of this you're skipping. Sound good? All right. You know me, I like to do examples, so let's do a couple examples. All right. So let's take a look at this. So we have, let, let's make sure everybody's clear on what's going on. What's up? You three over here. I'm going to need to get Mr. Dowdy and sort of set him over there or something. Because you're in the middle. I need a microscope. <laughs> I'm going to remember this. All right, all right, all right. All right, so, okay, so let's, let's go into the problem. So we have a T-beam shown. We got typical uh, material parameters. We have 4 KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel. Now, it's a 20-foot long beam. So when I say length, let's be clear. I'm talking about length in and out of the screen. So if I took this and extended it out, the beam's 20-foot long. Now, it's got a superimposed dead load of one kip per foot, and it has a live load of two kips per foot. Okay. Now, for the floor system, um, these dimensions are a little small, so I decided to blow them up right here. So the girder spacing is 10 feet. We have a 12-inch wide web, a 4-inch thick flange. We have an 18-inch effective depth and a 21-inch total depth, okay? And what our job is is to determine how much steel we need 
in this particular cross section. Sound good? All right, let's go to work. All right, so let's pull this up. Oh, that is concrete or steel. I need concrete. Super. Okay, it's good. So superimposed. What I mean is, okay, what load must all beams be able to withstand? Their own self weight. So there's dead load associated with own, with its own self weight, and I'm saying there's another one kit per foot in dead load. So. So that, that's what I mean by that. That's a good question. All right. Sound good? Oh. All right. Self-weight. We got to worry about that. We got, we got some stuff to deal with on that one. All right. Let's see what we can come up with. All right. Now. So step one for a design procedure is to compute M sub U. I can do better than that. All right, so we need our factored moments. Now, we've got dead load and we've got live load. So, like, once we get the beam self weight, we can factor those loads and WL squared over eight. That's simple. But what we need is the self-weight of the beam. Okay. Let's just keep this simple. To compute the self-weight of the beam, I'm going to walk you through this a little bit. So we have taken the unit weight of concrete and multiplied it by what? The, the cross-sectional area. Exactly right. So what we need is the cross-sectional area of the T-beam. All right. So we've got a T-shape. We know how wide the web is. We know how deep it is. How wide is that top flange? How wide is that? We don't, say it again, we don't know. So we have to compute the effective flange width. So the first thing I'm going to do is that. Now, let's see if you all remember where I'm at. So effective flange width. Now how about this? It's the minimum of three things. Make you all go through your notes. Like I'm making y'all study or something. Oh no! Not not you help me out. No 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 no. Now I'm calling on you, Mr. Dowdy. No, say, no. We're gonna you you tell me the first one, but he's gonna tell me the second one. No no no. no L over four. Now hold on. Now hold on. He's gonna tell me the next one. There we go. B W plus sixteen H F. And the last one. That one's simple. That's just the spacing. I am not going to begrudge somebody who wants to get involved in concrete design. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, camaraderie. <laughs> All right. What is the span length? No, that, that, there we go. S is the spacing. The span length, how long it is. No, this, 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 I, I can see where you're getting at. All right, the span length's 20 feet, right? But that's girder spacing. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> You're like, it's going into accounting right now or something? <laughs> now, now, hold on. We're looking at beam dimensions. So what do I ought to do? There we go. Exactly, inches. So I need to take this and convert it to inches. So it's 20 feet divided by 4 times what? 12 inches per foot? Does that sound about right? Nah, guys, come on. Oh, hold on. We are going to get through this together. All right. Next one. All right. Come on. Pat, pay attention. All right. All right. B sub W plus 16 HF. What's B sub W? All right. What's HF? Or there we go. There we go. So. 
I'm going to call on Mr. Fadiga to do this next. <laughs> now, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, let me get the next one. Somebody over here, tell me what the next one is. S is what? Which is? All right. So the minimum of 20 divided by 4 is 5. 5 times 12 is 60 inches. 12 plus 16 times 4, 16 times 4 is 64, plus 12 is 76. I cannot believe I did that in my head. And then 120. Wow. It really is Monday, isn't it? Is that what it is? So the minimum, so 60 inches. Sound good? So you told me that to compute the self-weight of the beam, we need the unit weight of concrete, which what is unit weight for concrete? Normal weight? There we go. All right. Now we also need the area. So how am I going to compute the area of this, this T-beam? So math, that, that, that is correct. We are going to use math. All right, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, so this is important. So we've got this. We've got H sub F is 4 inches. We now know this dimension here is what? All right. Now, what's the total height? There we go. And this dimension right here. So I guess I should put H equals. And this dimension right there. And that is B sub W. So tell me how to compute the gross area. You tell me what to do. I'll tell you what, let's keep it simple. All right, I propose it is the area of the top minus the or plus the area of the bottom. So what's the area above the dotted line? It's symbol, it's symbolical. BHF. All right. So BHF is the area of the flange. The area of this web portion, the stem, uh, is what? There we go. So we got BHF plus um, H minus HF times BW. Everybody okay on that? No, no. All right, so we have H minus HF times BW. That's this one. BHF is that one. All right, so we've got, what do we have? We have 60 inches times 4 inches plus... 21 inches minus 4 inches times 12 inches. Somebody tell me what that is. Okay, we got a 444. Somebody second that? There we go. All right. It was seconded. The motion passes. Now, what do I need to do with that? No, 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 no. Yeah, you do know. There you go. So we take the self-weight and we say, all right, it is the unit weight of concrete times the gross area, which the unit weight is what? Say, no, what did you say? No, 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 but what but did you say, though? Okay, 150, but... If we want kips, we'd say 0.15. That's the point I wanted to make. So 0 0.15 kips per cubic foot times 444 square inches. That's not okay. So what do we do? There we go. Because one square foot, 144 square inches. I'm getting y'all to design some, some concrete beams here. There we go. What do we got? What's that? 0.4625. Do I have a second on that? 
All right, so we'll, we'll call that 0.463. So if I had a one foot segment of that beam, it would weigh 463 pounds. So not exactly a feather. Now, you tell me, what do we need to do? Well, we add it to the one kit per foot and then do what to it? Factor it. There we go. So we take W sub U is 1.2 W sub naught plus W sub D plus 1.6 W sub L. And again, this is already reduced. We ain't got to worry about that. So 1.2 times 0.463 kips per foot. Uh, oh, getting ahead of myself. Plus, and the dead load was what? One kip per foot. Plus 1.6 times, what's the live load? Two. And that comes out to be what? Say it again. 4.96. Do I have a second on that? There we go. All right. Now what? There we go. This is exciting stuff, isn't it? Now, now, now. All right. So... How long was the beam again? 20 feet. 20 feet. There we go. So 4.96 kips per foot. 20 feet. Don't forget to square that. Divided by 8. And MU is what? 247.8. 248. <laughs> A student of Bill Pearson, if I ever heard one. <laughs> All right. Does everybody get up? You good with that value? Now, I know, I know this was a, a little bit of an involved step one, but I, I think this is important to, you know, make sure you can compute the effective flange width, get the self-weight, uh, and all that. So, <laughs> I saw that video. <laughs> I saw that video. <laughs> All right, hold on. Does everybody does everybody have this? Okay. <laughs> the best part was the comparison between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Mr. Bean, like that. <laughs> okay. So that's step one. That's simple, right? What's step two? We need m sub n. Now, in order to compute m sub n, we got to do what? <laughs> there we go. I'm getting y'all trained up. So we are computing a required m n, and we are assuming. that. So MN, I can do better than that. Required is going to be taking an MU value and dividing it by a fee which is 247.8 foot kips divided by 0.9 which is what? 275.33 foot kips. Now, right now, we're going to take this value and plug it in with a lot of FC primes and FYs and beam dimensions. So what do I ought to do? And to do what? Multiply by 12. All right, so take this, multiply it by 12, and what do we get?
Yeah, I got 3303, 3304, something like that. So, that, that good? Oh, no, 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 no. Now, that's a quick step, right? That was much shorter than the last one. All right, what's our next step? Well, we're going to plug and chug something. All right, so let's be clear. Right now, right now we are assuming a rectangular cross-section. So th this is an assumption. We're going to verify it real quick, but it's an assumption. So step three. Guys, come on. Well, don't talk. Focus on, on rebar and concrete. So we are assuming a rectangular T-beam, okay? So assuming this rectangular T-beam, let's compute row required. Now this one's a long one. It's a long equation. So 0 0.85. FC prime divided by FY, and then, let's see, we've got 1 minus the square root of 1 minus 0 0.85 FC prime BD squared, and then 2MN required. I'm going to need your help on this one. So, 0 0.85 times what's FC prime? Uh, 60 KSI is the rebar. One minus. One minus. We're definitely going to need some seconds on this value when I get it all written out. So 0 0.85. 4 KSI times, what's B? 60, yeah. We're assuming rectangular cross-section. And D is what? 18 inches. Nope. Oh. Come on. And then 2 times, what is MN required? There we go. All right, so need a little bit of help on this one. All right, zero zero. All right, hold on, guys. Hold on, guys. Come on, man. All right, point zero zero two nine one. Do I have a second on that? All right. So zero point zero zero two nine one. Really, you need to make sure that you can do that calculation. I mean, this is a calculation you're going to do quite a bit. So the answer is 0, 0, 00291. Um, if you haven't achieved that, you, ne you need to make sure that you're able to work the HP50 or Casio or whatever calculator you're using. I said achieve. I said I, did I say achieve? You know... You fool me, can't get fooled again, right? <laughs> Politics, right? <laughs> hey, he said that. I'm <laughs> What's that? No, I got the number right. Come on. All right, okay, all right. Now, let's be clear. To compute this, we have a rectangular T-beam, right? Now, right now, what we're going to do is verify that assumption, okay? So what I'm going to call step four is I'm going to call it compute the resulting A value. And then I'm going to have you all tell me what that means. So compute resulting A. Now, the resulting A value we're going to compute is this. So it's A equals row required. Um, FY D over 
0 0.85 FC prime. So let's be clear. So what we're doing is we're saying, all right, this would be the reinforcement ratio that we would need if we had a rectangular beam. Let's see if we do have a rectangular beam by computing this. So plug and chug. D's what? What is the D distance? 18 inches. <laughs> Guys. So what do we get here? 0.923. Is that, do I have a second on that? This is good enough. Now, now, hold on. What I'm most interested in is if everybody agrees with the value, I want everybody to tell me what this means. Exactly. We assumed correctly because this distance is less than H sub F. So I'll say assumption was valid. So A is less than h sub f, therefore a rectangular t-beam. Okay, that's important to recognize. Okay, that's really important to recognize. All right, um, if that is the case, you tell me what to do. All right, so what's step five say? There you go. Simple. So, So zero zero two nine one. What's B? Sixty. Yeah, it's it's not the web. It's the whole thing because the stress block is that wide. So, and D is eighteen. But what does that come out to be? Three point one four. So that's it. Just find a rebar pattern that has an area greater than or equal to 3.14 square inches and, and fits within a web width of 12, 12 inches. All right, so let me show you something real quick and we'll, we'll sort of call it. Does everybody have this? Okay, all right. So let me just show you something to sort of close it out because I think by now you can pick a rebar pattern. So, um, so for step six, if I say choose reinforcement pattern, I propose that here is a potential solution. Okay, so So that goes on, that goes on. All right, I propose that one of the rebar solutions that you could pick is in fact four number eights. So if you pick four number eights, the area of steel is in fact 3.14 square inches. So that is one of your options, okay? And it also works. Because if you go through and calculate the capacity, when I say it works, I mean, it is, it's like dead on. Because what's step seven? There you go. All right, so what was MU? Somebody tell me what MU was. 
247.8, right? So if you calculate MU, you get 247.8. Okay? If you calculate VMN for this beam, you will get a VMN of 247.82. That is. And again, and again, all right, I don't want you to think, I need to bump that rebar up a little bit. Be clear, you have taken the dead loads, bumped them up 20%. You've taken the live loads, bumped them up 60%. You've already taken the design capacity and reduced it by 10%. There are boatloads of factors of safety already built in. So this is a great result. That is a great result. Okay, now that's after you've done all the calcs. I haven't done that because you all know how to do that by now. And ACI requirements are met. All right, you and you, but you go ahead. Yes. That's bad. That's bad. Yes. That would mean more factored load than there are, than factored resistance. Now, let me be clear. If you had a hundred point one percent efficiency. That does not mean if you take a feather and put it on the beam that it explodes. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm really trying to make an honest point. Again, you could physically put more load and it would probably be fine. The answer is I don't have specific certainty as to whether or not it's fine. I do now. Well, hold on. I know everybody's packing up, but I want to hear this question. Yes, sir. That's a, that's a good question. So the question is, what if you carry the decimal point out? What I'll say is, if you actually track your decimals on MU, this one comes out to be like 247.76. So it's actually lower. Um, as for the steel, when I did the steel and I tracked all my decimals, I got 3.139. So I actually tracked it out. But if you carry it out and it actually causes it to be a little more, yeah, you are going to have to pick a little higher. Okay, but it wouldn't matter on points or whatnot. Would it be kind of like no, 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 no. It would not. No, no. Okay. no. I carried this out and I got a like 4.143. Yeah, yeah. You probably, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd have to. All right, is everybody good? All right. Next time what we're going to do is we're going to do example 10B. And take a while, guess what you think is going to happen? Well, actually, no, we're not going to do that next time. Next time we have exam review. And then we have a celebration on Friday. I thought I forgot about that. <laughs> Then we'll do the true TV. All right. That's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday. Be prepared to ask questions on Wednesday. All right.